Hi, I'm Jeff Harold with the Lake County Art League, and I'm here with Signita Budke, and she is a pastel artist and nationally known, internationally known, uh, and her work is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, I consider it more of a, a photorealistic work uh, that she does, but the curations are really incredible and unique. So with that said, being said, Signita, would you like to give us a little bit about your background and how you got into uh, pastels? Yes, thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the Lake County Art League for inviting me here today. I am actually a self-taught artist, and I currently live in New Jersey, but I'm originally from Illinois. So I grew up in Barrington, Illinois, and I went to school at Barrington High School. And so I was really excited to be invited by the Lake County Art League to kind of get back into Illinois a little bit, even though it's virtual, it's still pretty exciting for me. I, since I said I'm self-taught, I learned so much of what I do just by exploring and experimenting. And when I was in high school, I was in an art program that introduced me to almost every medium out there. We did watercolor, acrylic, oil, colored pencil, printmaking, um, and then of course pastel. And previous to that art class, I was always working in colored pencils. And so everything I did was in colored pencils. And as you know, you can get these beautiful sharp points on your colored pencils. And I started to fall in love with realism and hyper-realism and started creating drawings that reflected that. Um, the only thing was with colored pencil was that I wanted to work large and with colored pencil, it, it is pretty time consuming to go to that really large format. And so when I was first introduced to pastel, I immediately fell in love with this medium. Number one, because it's a dry medium. So I tried the watercolor oil acrylic and while I love it, I was definitely more drawn towards a dry medium, which is why I loved colored pencil. And when I realized that pastel was pure pigment with just like a little bit of binder. So the colors are insane. They're so pure, they're so bold and so vibrant. I just, I fell in love with this medium and I started doing so many pastel artworks. And that's where I really started to develop a technique where I could combine my love for realism with this dry medium that I could work on a larger scale and work with really beautiful vibrant and bold colors. And so that's kind of how I got into pastel. And I know a lot of people always ask, um, you know, when I started pastel, why did I go into realism? Because so much of what you see in pastel is not necessarily very detailed, but maybe a little more loose and, um, you know, not as tight and detailed. And the reason why I chose to go that way is because that is what I fell in love with with colored pencil was the realism and I wanted to translate that over. And so that's how I got into this medium and fell in love with it. And I have been working with pastels for so many years now and almost everything that I exhibit in galleries and the classes that I teach are all in pastel. Yeah, it's sort of interesting that you said you started with colored pencil uh, and in the way because I have a friend, Phil Shorn, who's a nationally known uh, color pencil artist. And he does absolutely wonderful uh, color pencil and fairly large. But uh, I've watched him work and uh, talked to him. And yeah, you're right. It takes uh, quite a while to, to do that. OK, and especially get the if you're doing anything of any size, you know, so so I I really have a good understanding of, of that. I'm sure Phil would appreciate it, too. So, right. I know. pencil. I was generally I'd say like. And I know every artist does something different, but for me, I was working like eight by 10 with colored pencil. And when I switched to pastel, some of my paintings are like 30 by 40. So yeah. it was a huge change in like the size and scale of what I was able to do um, at a much quicker pace than what was happening with the colored pencils. Yes. Okay, now let's go back into something that you and I talked about before. And that's exactly how did you... Uh get into doing art full-time when you went and got a finance degree? Okay, so yes, um, as you know, I graduated from Barrington High School and I went to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and I went and got a degree in finance. And 
the re I'm going to tell you the reason why I did that was I come from a family of immigrants and education is like the ticket to a future and success and being able to, um, you know, pay for your house and your food and things like that. And so art was never really even considered an option. We didn't even know that it was a possibility to be a professional artist. And so I went and got the finance degree. And a lot of people ask me, do you regret going to school and spending those four years doing finance, knowing now that you ended up being a professional artist? And the answer is no, I don't regret it at all. I learned so much during those four years. After I graduated, I did work in corporate America um, for a very short amount of time. And I have to tell you, it made me appreciate so much the time I get to spend being creative and being artistic and feeling like myself. Because when I was in finance, I did not feel like myself at all. And that experience made me so grateful that every day I get to paint and I get to create art for a living. It's, it feels like a gift. It really does. It truly does. And what happened was after I graduated and I started working in finance, I just knew, you know, I just knew that there was no way. I was like, what was I thinking picking this field? This is not me at all. How am I going to spend the rest of my life doing this? And I was young at that time. And I thought, you know, I only, I don't have responsibilities beyond myself at this point. I don't have children that I need to take care of. I don't have, um, you know, any sort of responsibilities. I'm going to try, I'm going to give myself some time and try this route of becoming a professional artist and see if it's possible to actually have a career like this. And so I gave myself a few years. I said, I'm gonna give myself two years. That In my mind, that's what I thought. I'm gonna give myself two years and see what happens. If I see that there's a potential here, I will continue. And if not, I will go back to finance. And again, I didn't know any professional artists and I didn't really know what I was doing at all. I had no idea where to go. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I loved painting and I knew what I wanted to paint. That was the one thing is that I did know I wanted to do still life. And I had this vision in my mind of what I wanted to put out there, but I didn't know where to go with it. And so the first thing I did is I went local and I went to my local art guild just to see what was going on. And they were having a juried exhibition coming up. So I thought, okay, let me just enter one of my art pieces there and get to know people. So the piece was accepted. I went to the opening reception and I got to meet other artists that were local and other people locally that gave me a lot of really great information about you know, more national things, things in New York City, things in other parts of the country. And so I started and somebody at the guild, at the guild that I went to said, have you heard of the Pastel Society of America? And at that time I said, no, I have not. And they were also having an upcoming juried exhibition. So I entered a piece there and their show is in New York City. And I was accepted and I won a wonderful award for my painting there. And when I went there, I met people from people travel to go to that show. So I met people from not only New York City and the East Coast, but nationwide and a few international as well. And the more I got to meet artists, I, I asked so many questions. And I have to tell you, most of the artists that I did speak with were so helpful, so willing to share information, not everyone, but so many. And I learned so much just by constantly going to events, going to the opening receptions, going to the galleries, talking to people. And that first year that I decided to do this, I entered 40 juried exhibitions. So it was a lot. Oh. I I oh, went, crazy, entered and entered and I was shipping artwork too. I went neat, like all over. And oh. I, it was the most amazing feeling because um, I was able to exhibit, like the whole goal was to share my art. And I was able to do that. And then it was very, I just felt so honored to have been selected for a bunch of awards. And after that, I got contacted by some magazines. There was an article in a magazine called Southwest Art Magazine. And the article was the top 21 artists under the age of 31. 
And they featured me in that article. And after that article was the first time I was contacted by art galleries. So that's sort of how I even got my foot in the door into art galleries. Well, And you've, you've also been in, in other magazines, too. Okay, I uh, Fine Art Connoisseur, American Art Collector, Artist Magazine, uh, a, a French one, uh, Petit des Arts, I guess I can't pronounce it right. But yeah, you've been in a lot of them. And uh, that's saying a whole lot right there. I mean, uh, you know, it shows that your quality of work is being recognized. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Um, it's it's just so nice to, you know, be able to share my art with people and to be able to exhibit. And once I started um, working with the galleries the, after that magazine, that's sort of when I said, oh, my gosh, this is going to become a career because I started selling a lot of art. Yeah. And I was like, it's not a hobby anymore. This is something that I am actually making and earning a living from. And after that, I remember the year. that I started making more money than my finance job. And yes, I can do this. I can proceed forward. I don't have to go back. And so, um, you know, it's been, it's been a really cool journey and, you know, just something I'm so excited about. Okay. Uh, yeah. And you have art in a number of places, uh, San Diego Art Institute, uh, Butler Institute of American Art, uh, National Art Center in Taipan, uh, Taiwan, Taipei, Taiwan, uh, and uh, Art Gallery in Hamilton, Ontario. I mean, you definitely are internationally known. But but the one that you and I talked about before a little bit was, and I was so, a little surprised, You actually have uh, your work included in the United States Embassy. Uh, and is it the, San Diego or No, where, where it at? It's... no. So it was the United States Embassy in Sana, Yemen. Oh, So it okay. was, it was an, so what happened was the ambassador that was there at the time, he wanted to do an exhibition of art from the American West. And I had two paintings that I had done. And this isn't typical to the work that you probably have seen in the magazines and in um, the art galleries, but it was two landscapes, which I rarely do landscapes. One was Yosemite and one was um, uh, Sedona. And um, he, he chose those two paintings. And so they were in the United States Embassy for a few years before they were returned back to the United States. So Wow. really cool opportunity. Um, and just very exciting. Wow, that is that is fantastic. And your work definitely deserves to be in all these places. Uh, and speaking of that, okay, how about if we head out to your website? All right, and take a look at some of this work that uh, I've been bragging about to the league here. So uh, I I'm sure once they see your work, they are not going to think I was just bragging on, you know, for nothing. So, so anyways, let me, let me do a little screen share here and we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at your website. All right. Uh, and, uh, these are just, I, the first time I looked at these, I could not believe they were pastel paintings. All right. Uh, they, you know, being a photographer, I'm so used to photorealism uh, that the first thing I thought was, oh, oh, she does photography. And it's like, no, <laughs> take a closer look because these are very nicely done. Uh, and, and I'm going to go ahead and just, uh, let's jump into, uh, anyone in particular, how about the fruit and vegetable paintings? Sounds good. Okay. And, uh, this is a, really, uh, You know, you got a pineapple here. Uh, what was there was another one that I was I was looking at. You got a peach, bananas. This is sort of interesting. Uh, I like this the transition of the cherries from the yellow. All right, but there's there's one thing that you said that you always do, even though you're doing basically photorealism, you also add defects to it, right? Yes, I do. I always like to incorporate some sort of like scratch or something on the surface of the skin of the fruit. Um, I feel like it adds so much to the painting and to the overall meaning of the story behind the painting. 
And I think, Jeff, I think we were talking about the pair that your cursor is on right now. That one this right there. One. Yeah, yeah, this one shows it even more. Yeah, this one shows it even more. I don't know if people can see my cursor here, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you can you can see the the brown spots. You know how any any pear or any fruit really that ages, it's going to get bumps and nicks and what have you. And a lot of times those turn start turning a rust color or, or gray or a, a brown. Uh, so not only that, uh, but just this is a very unique. How do you come up with this idea of doing this pear in layers like this? You know, so for all of my still life, the original concept behind this entire series with the dark backgrounds and the very high contrast in lighting was that I almost imagined that they were on stage with like a spotlight illuminating them from above. And that's where this vision all started off. And as I kept going with it, I felt like each piece the story kept changing and the, the story kept, I kept adding more. And so for this, this one was, this concept was all about, you know, putting something back together that initially seems broken. And that's where the story was heading. But that's also why I included not only the slices, but you can see a lot more of like the scratches and things like that. Yes. And I think in this format where, where we're sort of highlighting it instead of trying to cover it up, you know what I mean? Where it's, oh, it's yeah. more focused. You there? I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we lost your voice there for a minute. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, I agree. And and the other thing that's sort of interesting, and you as a painter, okay, can take the lighting and you can play with it more than uh, as you paint. All right. Whereas if I were to set the still life up in the same manner, and I've done stuff like this, I would have to have a reflector on the, the far side in order to fill some of these shadows. Uh, but I see that you actually, I don't know if you're actually seeing this, if you're actually getting the fill in here, but uh, I noticed that even the fill on the dark side is nice and, and, and realistic. It looks real. Thank you. It's my favorite thing to do is to play around with the lighting. Um, not So what I do is I work from life. And then when I have to, I will use a reference if it's something like, for example, that pair that I cut up, I wasn't able to complete that in a timeline where it wasn't rotting. And so yeah, I started, yeah, this one. I, yes, I drew in the composition and I got, I don't know, midway through it. And I was like, okay, we're at a point where this needs to now be thrown out. And so I um, photographed it and I use that as a reference, but the lighting is so different than what you would see in my photo reference. My photo reference yeah. does not look like what my paintings look like. And I play so much with the lighting. But I always say, and especially to my students, when I play with the lighting, before I started playing with it, I spent so much time just understanding how actual light works. So if I were to take a single light source and move it around my fruit, I want to know in real life what actually happens right? Like, how does it actually change? How does the light really behave? Now, as an artist, if I want to change it, I have to know exactly what would be realistic and what wouldn't be realistic. And if it's not going to be realistic, how can I change it to make the viewer believe that it's realistic? This and is so, yeah, this is something that I think uh, would be important for, be especially for beginning artists to understand, yes. because I know beginning artists, you always learn about like, you know, uh, color palettes and, and, you know, color will color, you know, compliments, what have you. Uh, but also what does real lighting look like? Whether you're going to do a realistic painting or not, you need to understand the effect of the different gradations of light have on your subject and, and how it gives them form, if nothing else. Exactly. Exactly. Even if you're going to change it, at least know what it really is. Right. It makes you learn and think so much about how you're going to approach the still life. And so, for example, in that piece that you had shown me before with the persimmon, the one right before this, um, the lighting was completely different. And I did play around. So, it's uh, right. It was right. Um, is that one? No, to the right, to the right. The one. Yep. The three. Uh huh. The, no, oh, those three. Oh, OK. I didn't know what a persimmon was. So. Um, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. These are Learn persimmon. New every day. <laughs> These are persimmon. They're actually really tasty as well. But so 
with the lighting on this one, you see like in the back how I'm sort of curling the shadows almost on the fruit to go back and disappear into the background. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. That doing. I'm doing it because I like the way it, it gives it this form, but also feel sort of mysterious in a way just by playing with the lighting. And also in my, and I know you can absolutely do these things in photography. So it's not like you can't manipulate photographs, right. but I'm doing it in, in an art format where I'm doing it with um, uh, actual paint and pastels. The little hints of orange that you see underneath the persimmon were also, I have seen that. I know when that happens. Was it happening in this adult life setup? No, I added yeah. that as an art. But you yeah. know, you learn start to study and explore a little bit more. Yeah, and you're, you're absolutely right about the, even in photography, because uh, quite frankly, you go out on the web or Twitter or, or Instagram or wherever you want to look, and you look at like landscape photographs, uh, flowers, anything out there. And I'll guarantee you, everything out there has been touched with Photoshop or some other product. Uh, to enhance it, sometimes to a great degree, sometimes to a lesser degree. Uh, I don't think I, I I can think of maybe uh, two, maybe three photographs that I have that I did next to nothing to other than just, you know, get on and maybe just tweak the exposure a tad or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they all require to get the best image and what you visualize as should be the final image you have to know what that is and you have to, you know, play with it and get it, you know? So you're doing the same thing. You, you, I, I think you remind me of uh, Ansel Adams. Uh, a lot of people don't know him. He was probably the most famous uh, photographer in the fifties, but that's basically one of the things he said is, is that, you know, I can teach you technique. I can teach you the, the you know, technical aspects of exposure, what have you. The one thing I cannot do is I cannot give you a creative vision. And it's that vision that then is your your end goal in that piece that you're working on. So, it's not, yeah, it sounds yeah. like it's, that's what you do. Definitely. It's, well, and, first of all, for that comparison, oh, my goodness, that's um, amazing. Thank you. And also, I agree with the creativity aspect of it is that you know, you have to have a vision. And that was the one thing when I started off, I did, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. It was just, how do I get there? And so, um, you know, this is uh, one of my favorite, still life is one of my absolute favorite compositions to create. And I do want to say one other thing, since we were talking about learning and, and that part of it, you know, when I first started out, because I'm self-taught, I had a lot of people want to give advice, whether I asked or not, and that's okay. But if you are new and starting out, remember that so much of what you hear, that's a rule. I was told never to blend with my fingers using pastels because pastels get very muddy. You wanna do very, very limited blending. It will end up ruining the, um, you know, the brightness and intensity of the colors. And while that can be true, I understand where that came from, I blend, almost entirely all of my work. So you can listen and then experiment to see why maybe that, why would somebody say that? Is there a way to go around that? Is there a way to maybe create your own view of that? So a, another thing I was told was don't use black in your shadows because it will appear dull. I use black in my shadows every single time. I love the way it looks. So, you know, yeah. just experiment. If you hear a rule, that's okay. Just listen, you know, listen to what you, the rule is and then decide for yourself whether you feel like that is something that makes sense to you or does not make sense to you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's really uh, true in just any medium you talk about. Uh, you know, and I find that uh, I've, use digital mediums uh, rather than the physical ones. Uh, and uh, I find that when I experiment and play, I learn more techniques. And sometimes I come up with something that, you know, I wouldn't expect from a digital or, you know, image, what have you, or a digital process. And it's that 
playing that allows me to keep my creativity going because it makes me think of, oh, hey, this is neat. Okay, I can do this. How can I use this to make, you know, a good image? So, you know, I, I agree 100%. And I think that's true in all the art forms. The more you play with stuff, the more you try different mediums, different technologies, uh, the more tools you have at hand to be creative. So, yes. But I want to get back to one thing too. Uh, while we're talking about it, you were talking about doing something that, uh, uh, you know, you're told not to do, you know, blending with your fingers. Okay. Uh, what type of paper do you use? So I work on pastel papers that feel like sandpaper, like the sandpaper that you would get at a hardware store. Um, they are beautiful sanded pastel papers. My two favorite are UART 400 grade and Art Spectrum Color Fix pastel papers. I absolutely love those papers. And if you are new to pastel and you've tried like the pastel papers that you see at the art store that have more of a smooth surface. Those are great papers. Those are wonderful papers, but they are very different than working on a sanded pastel paper. If I were to try to recreate this on a smooth paper, it would look different. It would look very different than what you see here. Um, the sanded pastel papers for me and for my technique, really, I layer so many layers. So this, these papers can hold up to 10 layers of pastel. So you wow. can really saturate the paper with color and the colors appear so vibrant on the papers. Um, it is a huge difference. At least if you're going to experiment, see which one you like better because yeah. I stand it, but there are several artists who do phenomenal, beautiful paintings on the more smooth surfaces as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I want to go to another set of your paintings here. And if I can find them here, uh yeah i think this is where we yeah this is this is where we were uh we were talking about these one time and uh, so you're not creating just you know a picture of a pear or apple you actually have some compositions here that are very interesting uh, and for example this one it looks like egg cartons with a little mesh and some uh, some cherries is that, am I seeing that correctly? Yeah, it's like those little berry containers. Yeah. You know, like strawberries or something and sometimes at the grocery stores in them. This was a, this piece um, in particular, again, all of my, all of my paintings have these, I feel like I could write like a whole novel about the stories that go on in my mind, but I, I shared like a little bit of it because I don't want to put too much of an idea in someone's head when, you know, it could be interpreted completely differently. But yeah. uh, this one, um, it was called Freedom. And I think you can kind of see where I was heading in that direction with the two that are out on the right. And then the one that's sort of still trapped in the in the net. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, here, yeah. They're mm -hmm. making their escape. Yes, and there's like stems sticking out in certain areas, like more in the dark. If you're in person, you definitely can or if you zoom, you can see it a little bit more clearly, but um, there's stems kind of sticking out so you can see that there's more in there. Yeah. Okay, and then this one, this one I thought was interesting, just from the standpoint of uh, you got equal equilibrium between uh, six lemons and one lemon and three butterflies. And those must be the heaviest butterflies I have ever <laughs> seen in my life. You know? <laughs> but it's just it's it's an interesting concept and i i don't think i would have thought of something like that but it is very very fascinating the way you did that thank you and that's exactly what it was i wanted you to feel the weight of those butterflies because that's what this piece was about and so um the fact that you mentioned that makes me really happy <laughs> so yeah. well i i raise butterflies too so you know oh. It's uh, yeah. it, we put butterflies and something like that, and you know it'll attract my attention very quickly. <laughs> uh, -huh. uh, so and then we have another one with cherries here, and then we have this one, which I thought was another interesting one. A little, uh, 
I don't, I don't want to say violent, but <laughs> <laughs> I feel sorry for that. Uh, what is that? Uh, is that another cherry or? They're apples. They're apples. Oh, okay. So you just, okay. <laughs> It's It's so an apple. interesting. It, it, there's two things interesting about this from my standpoint. Okay, one is just the composition of what you're doing, but also the background in this case because it's it's different from the other backgrounds that we've seen. You actually have some some uh, gray in here, some more of a uh, fog, you know, pattern or what have you. Is there a reason you did that in this one or? So yes, there's always a reason. So in this one, do you see on the, I'm going to point this out on the two left, the apple right in the center that has the knife through it. And then that the one I'm... left. My left or your left? When you're looking at it, the left. Yep. That the, that one. This one. So, no, okay. So, these two. No, the other two. Oh, these two. Yep. Yes. So those okay. two, do you see how like on the left side of the apple, there's that dark uh, um, of the backside. Yes. Yeah, around here. Yeah, on, on both of these, you have that. Yes. I don't want that to go into the dark black. I wanted that to come out. And so I put the gray intentionally oh. behind those two areas so that you could see that dark. And that would be the darkest point. Because if I had the, the black background, it would disappear right in. And I didn't want that to happen in this way. Whereas on the right side, if you go over to the apple that's on the right, that one yeah. is definitely creeping into the dark yeah but it's still it's still standing out you still see the form because you haven't gone totally black over yeah. here either so yeah, on either but, uh, one of these so mm -hmm. you maintain the contrast to to bring the subject out uh from the background but still have that fading back into it effect yeah yeah okay another butterfly and i do have um, Right now, when if you um, are following me on Instagram or if you check my website in a few weeks, I have like a whole butterfly series coming up that wow. I have not at all yet. So I'm really excited about it. Now, where do you get the butterflies from as far as, you know, for the coloring and everything? Because uh, the ones back here looked like either monarchs or viceroys. Mm -hmm. And that one was a blue so, morpho. This so, like, and this is a, a blue morph morpho? Mm-hmm. So I actually, so we have a lot of butterflies in our area and in the summer I videotape them. So I'm, ah. I'm recording and I record them and then I take stills off the record, like what I'm recording, but then the lighting is completely different because it's usually out in the bright sun or like, it's not in my studio. Right. Yeah. And so I, have to, I have to envision what it would look like if it were in this still life versus what it was like outside. Um, so that's a little bit different. And I also, we had a butterfly, there was like a butterfly conservatory. There's a couple of them around here where they have not only the native ones, but all sorts of really cool, uh, you know, different varieties and species that you wouldn't normally find on the East coast. Oh yeah. And I record because if I take photos, I don't always get exactly, they're, they're quick, right? They move quickly. And yeah. so oh, yeah. um, I need to have like the whole, not just like a quick little instant so yeah that, that's one of the nice things about uh raising them because i raise basically monarchs in the summer and the thing is is, is you get them right as they come out of their their uh, cocoon or uh they emerge okay they have to let their wings dry okay they can't just fly so they climb up to something high and they sit there and let their wings unfold and then they have to sit there for like an hour and it's like, okay, I have all this time in the world to photograph uh, the butterfly in its absolutely pristine condition. Oh, my goodness. So yeah. you must have many photographs of this. I have some. I'll, I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you one. Uh, I also go down to the uh, Chicago Botanic Gardens, which mm -hmm. you may be probably familiar with. Because uh, yeah. now they have a butterfly house down there. And on certain days, I think it's like Wednesdays. Uh, and from like nine to 10 or something like that, they allow people to come in to photograph with tripods. Oh, wow. And, uh, I, I have one that is just a head on shot. I caught you talking to me uh, and I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you pictures. So you can I, see. But you know, it's, it's those sort of things that, you know, you can use uh, and I use them in some of my different uh, works 
but I can see if you use those as subjects for your work, it adds more realism to them, okay, as far as it's something recognizable. Right, right. So any any reason why you had the combination of the cherries? I think that's what, a, a pear in there? And then so something it, else? It's what? cherries. I'm sorry, what was that? It's a lemon in the center and a fig on oh, the bottom. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. So when I was doing this, it was kind of this idea of like a circus balancing act sort of thing. So if you're at the <laughs> circus, <laughs> you're seeing like an interesting like array of things. And so I was trying to find yeah. things with shapes, different sizes. And of course, in reality, is a cherry really going to be able to balance with another one up over? No. So yeah. it's just... It adds, it, it adds tension to the picture. Yes. Is what it yeah. does. Well, yeah, it does. It adds tension. <laughs> you're, you're waiting for that to fall. You know? I know, everyone. How did you get that to stand? I'm like, I did not. I did not actually get it. <laughs> Again, <laughs> an advantage of painting over photography because <laughs> I'd have to go through quite a bit of hoops to get that to stay like that. You know, the thread hanging down to hold it up and then, you know, whatever. <laughs> But uh, yeah, all right, uh, let's, uh, I, I want to go on one more thing before we, while we still have time. And you, you not only the still lifes, uh, you've done some absolutely wonderful uh, portraits. Thank you. And so it's- Go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna say it's funny. So when I was, um, you know, in middle school and high school and just figuring out how much I love to draw. I was drawing portraits. That's what I started off doing was drawing people and portraits. I, I hadn't done a still life till much later. And when I was in high school, I started um, creating these port like pencil sketches. It was just black and white pencil. And I started creating these pencil sketches and my mom brought one to work. And all of a sudden I got orders for you know portraits and I, I had this like little business that I saved so much money before I started college by selling these commissioned portraits um so I love portraiture and I do think that somewhere along the way when I switched to still life and I didn't sw I'm still doing portraits but when I started introducing more and more still life all of the still life I do they all have personalities in my mind too like I did this group of uh, lemons and I remember thinking oh it's a family portrait of lemons like it's always something more human like that I yeah that over into the still life but oh. yeah it did start in portraiture okay uh this one was an interesting pose I like that but you and I were talking about this one earlier uh in another conversation and I remarked how I love the way you got the texture and the tonality of the skin you know, throughout the throughout the whole model there. And it's just, uh, I, I don't know, it, it's almost like a Rembrandt lighting, you know, because basically, you know, Rembrandt lighting is basically just one light shining down at like 45 degree angle. Uh, but uh, yeah, that and, and that doesn't that sort of require you to do some uh, uh, smoothing or blending, excuse me, blending with your fingers? To get that? Yes. yes, it does. For me, for my technique, I do so much blending. And I I do on Instagram, I have a video of a close-up of how I got her skin um, like that. And I blend a lot in that. And I always, for, for my technique, and I always tell my students, the number one thing about blending with pastels is you have to keep everything really clean. Um, when it starts to get messy, then the colors blend together and you do end up getting grays. And that's where you hear, oh, everything gets muddy if you blend too much. And like I said, I blend almost the entire composition, but I use my fingers like paintbrushes. And okay, so. But, but but doesn't the paper give you the advantage of doing that better? Because, you know, you were saying earlier and, and, and I played with pastels a long time ago. Uh but, but on paper, you can get maybe two, maybe three layers without really getting muddy and what have you. But if you're using this uh, sandpaper type paper, mm -hmm. and you said you can get up to like 20 layers, 
Doesn't mm -hmm. that help because you can blend a little bit and then you can adjust it easier? So you can, but the problem is if you're blending and you don't have your, whatever you're using to blend, if it's your fingers or whatever, if it has a lot of previous color on it and then you start blending, you're going to see that color on whatever you're blending. And that's where they say it'll start to get gray or muddy because you're now blending several different colors together. Yeah. If you start fresh, clean surface to blend every single time, you're only blending what's on top. You're not, nothing from previously is on your hands. And so I always tell my students I have, when I'm blending, I stick to this pretty true. I have, I dedicate three fingers to different things. So I'll do like middle values, highlights and shadows. And I will stick to it the whole time. So my darks stay in the darks. My lights, like the highlights will be bright and they won't have any previous colors on there. And then the middle values generally stay in that area as well. Yeah. Now, and again, I, I played with these back in like the 80s or 70s. So it's been a long time. But at that point in time, though, I remember that there was uh, it, there was like a spray fixative that you could apply to the pastel and then you could apply more layers over it without muddying it up too much. Is that still something that's in existence? Is that, do you use anything like that or, or what? <laughs> I don't use fixatives. They are very much still being manufactured and several artists do use them. So it is an option to do that. I don't love fixatives. I um, you know I've tried a lot of different brands and there are, for everything that I have tried thus far, I can see slight variations in the colors yeah. after I spray. And I don't like that. And so I don't use them. And what my process is, is like I said, I'm working on these sandpapers. So they really hold the pastel. And the two that I mentioned earlier when we were speaking, the UART and Art Spectrum, of all the sanded pastel papers I've tried, those two hold pastel like you can't believe. And what I do is I, at the end of every painting, I give it a really good tap on all four sides and then on the back so that if there's any loose pastel, let it fall now before it goes into a frame. So yeah. I'll go and give it a tap. And then once it's, and once it's framed, it can last lifetimes and it won't fall. I have had my art shipped internationally everywhere and you don't see any of the pastel falling on the glass yeah. you don't see it, it, it can last lifetimes and so um that is sort of my process of what and why i don't use fixatives okay yeah i noticed too in one of your pictures in your uh uh and i'm gonna go to your about page here for a second because i noticed in this picture you're working from the top down is that partly also because of preventing it pastels from falling down on other work yes okay. it's the because i work vertically the the dust of the pastel falls down right and wow. so you know if you're working you're going to end up seeing streaks of, especially because i have a heavy hand so a lot is falling it's if you have a lighter hand you definitely can get away with a little bit more yeah. um you know, and you don't, I, there's a lot of pastel artists that don't do top to bottom. They'll put in all their darks first and, or whatever method that they prefer. I do top to bottom, left to right. I do go upside down. So occasionally I will switch the orientation of the paper to make it easier for myself to work as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then uh, before we uh, finish up here, there was... Uh look at a couple more of these whoops there you go and the florals we didn't florals either the flowers excuse me the flowers paintings oh we oh yeah let's go through those <laughs> real quick too but this is a picture of your dad it uh, is and and you talked a little bit about this and what was it you were telling me something about your dad and why you posed him this way I know, because this isn't really a traditional, I guess, pose in the sense that, like you had mentioned, he's looking out the other direction. And this painting for myself, and I know I told you previously that um, my parents, my mom and my dad, like I hit the jackpot with my parents. They are the best parents anyone could ever ask for. And I grew up with so much support. My parents showed up to everything. They, they were always there. And, you know, as an adult, I have kids now. And it, it means even more to me now that I have children knowing everything that they did for me. 
And when I made this painting, I knew I wanted it for myself, for my house. Cause I rarely have art, my own art in my home. It's always like older stuff I did in high school. All the new stuff gets to galleries. And I was like, I want something from my house. And so I painted this of my dad. And you know, when you're little and you're at like some event, like, you know, chorus concert or whatever you're at, and you're searching and you're looking for your parents to see if they're there. And it always, my, my mom or dad were always there. And I remember just sitting next to them and like, this is the view I would see of my dad. You know what I mean? And he'd always yeah. be there. That, that's why I wanted to pose him in this way. Yeah. Well, that's nice. You did an excellent job on it. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's go. Okay. Let's go back and let's look at your flowers because these are something else having done flowers myself i just you know started a uh another project or uh, another series of flowers uh last summer uh and i am really impressed with these again you have a, such a photorealistic uh effect on uh, your painting there your effort and uh the lighting is wonderful thank you uh, and these are really great this is this is nice i would I, what can I say? I like the lighting and everything on that. It's excellent. Uh, and this is sort of, uh, sort of different. I've, I've done something like this myself, but not with roses like that, where you have all, all white flowers and then you have one yellow flower right in the middle or off to the side or what have you. Yeah. It, it just sort of, you know, draws attention to that one different colored flower. And, you know, in this case, you're, you're, I don't know if that's a yellow rose uh but uh it it, called a confetti rose just because it was ah. sort of and it had the tips were all like this bright orange red color yeah and I, I those are my favorite flowers to paint when there's they're not all one solitary color but there's something else going on yeah um that's why i also love like for example like the peony bud because you do see it's like a white flower but you do see like a little bit of the edge where it's like a reddish orange color again yeah this is yeah and and this is a a, a peony but and you know we have peonies out in back and they're they're gorgeous big flowers but mm -hmm. uh and and this actually is uh the type of work that i started on last summer is i started a series called secret life of flowers and that's exactly what it is it's seeing what people don't normally look at, you know, usually you have, they look at a big flower, the whole flower. And that's it. They never look at, well, here's it, here it is as a bud or here it is in combination with the bud or here it is from this angle and this light, or, you know, mm -hmm. here it is as it's, is beginning to open as a, as opposed to, you know, it's already open. Uh, and I, I think that's such a different way of looking at flowers because I usually don't see people doing that. Uh, I, I have one that is actually, it's a portrait of an ant and it's a big lily and that takes up about 90% of it. And there's one little black spot on it. And this ant is walking down the back of this lily. And it's, it's, uh, again, it's, it's looking at things in a way that people normally don't look at. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's yeah. what I, that's what I see in this, in this bud. Thank you. Yeah, it is. And I think, I know we, we were talking about this earlier was that with with seeing things in a little bit of a different light I work a lot at night when the sun is down and at the end when I'm finished I light candles and I look at the art with the candles flickering in the background and it is such a different experience than when you see it in daylight with the sun streaming in and in different environments and I I said it would be a dream of mine one day to have a candlelit exhibition of my artwork where everyone maybe comes in with like a candle and walks oh, around man. because that's how I see it at the end in my studio at the end of every day. And I feel like it would kind of be cool to see other people being able to see it in that same way that I do. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember us talking about that. It's, it, it would be a very cool idea. So and then you have a stargazer. And again, this is excellent. And my wife's favorite flowers, one of those are one of our favorites. Uh, uh, tulip, irises, we have all these. Uh, this is an orchid. Uh, 
yeah, it's an interesting color for the orchid. I don't know if I've seen that. Uh, we'll actually be going to the orchid show in February or later this month down at the Chicago Botanic Gardens. Uh, okay. And they have some absolutely such a huge variety of orchids. Mm -hmm. so, but this is this is this is excellent coloring and everything. So thank you. And then again, this is something that hasn't opened yet. And like I say, I think it's neat to be able to see something in a different way. You know, not as a full flower or anything, but here it is. It's just as pretty. Okay. I love, love them. I mean, obviously they're beautiful when they've opened as well, but yeah. there's something about when they're closed, they just look so, the, col the color is also different. You know what I mean? The whole thing is a little bit different when it's closed. Yeah. This one particularly cool because it had this like fringe at the end. I think it might've been called like a fringe tulip, but it had the tips of them looked frayed. And yeah, it was you, so you can see that up here, yeah. Yeah, it was such a cool flower. Okay. All right, let's uh, check out your workshops. Uh, you have a workshop February 18th, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And this is a Zoom uh, workshop. So, and uh, do you still have anything open as far as if people want to? Excuse me? I have one spot left. One spot left. Okay. All right. We will let people know that. Uh, and it starts on the, oh, the Zoom link will be sent on February 15th. Okay. And then uh, I'm going to stop the share here. Okay. And we're back live and virtual reality here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you will also in, what, a week no, two weeks, two weeks from uh, Monday, uh, you will be doing a virtual demonstration for the Lake County Art League. Uh, it'll be at seven o'clock our time, which will probably be about eight o'clock your time. And uh, actually, we will be uh, on Zoom, but we will also be streaming this to our Facebook page. So if you want to watch the demonstration, uh, they can check out on Lake County Art League facebook page and you should be able to see it there so what else uh before we wrap this up uh what else do you have that you'd like to get out there as far as events coming up uh anything else you want to throw out for the mix here so i have that like you said i have the um portrait workshop coming up and then after that it hasn't been announced yet but i'll be doing more still life workshops if you check my website i update pretty frequently. And the I usually teach about eight workshops a year. So it should be coming up pretty soon for the next still life mm -hmm. workshop. If you're on Instagram, I think that you'll be able to send the my Instagram name out right on the, the bottom of the screen. Or do you want me to just say it right now? Okay. Uh, you can say it right now if you want or send it to me and I'll, I'll add it. Add it to the video here. Okay, yeah, well, if, if you don't get a chance, it's Sankita, but okay, fine art. And I post a lot of demonstration videos on there. And my most like current and recent things that are going on in the studio. So that's up there as well. And thank you again for having me today. Okay. And if and if you if you'd like to when you have workshops coming up, if you'd like to send us uh, an email about them, I'll be happy to pass them on to our league and to the other leagues around here uh so people have a chance to sign up for them sounds great so all right then uh thank you very much uh we'll see you in a couple weeks and anything else other than goodbye <laughs> no thank you so much for having me and i'm yeah. looking forward to the yeah yeah i really enjoyed this i appreciated talking to you thank you same okay